So we started out talking about church hurt and dealing with church hurt. And as I said, we want to do these things in a way that is honoring to God. Whatever we're dealing with, we always want to honor God. Uh, this is an area that, as I said, has touched many lives based on the feedback and the personal experience. I know that it is real. How do we know it's real? Because we are, we've been hurt, A, and B, because we know whenever human beings are involved, there's going to be some imperfections because nobody's perfect. We talked about the consequences. People get wounded, broken relationships. People leave the church, uh, leave their church. They leave the church altogether. And we listed a number of other things. How do we deal with church hurt? We started by first, we needed to deal with the church. We talked about when God created the church. We looked at the book of Acts and the day of Pentecost and how the spirit of God was poured out. We looked at the meaning of church, ecclesia, the gathering of the saints. Where is the church? We looked at Acts 7.48, 1 Corinthians 3.16. We realized through scripture that we are the church because the Holy Spirit lives in us. We're the temple of Almighty God. So God's telling us by his word that he doesn't live in temples as in a uh, brick and mortar but he lives in us what did god say about going to church we looked at hebrews 10 and we saw that god said don't forsake assembling together meaning it's his will that we do go to church not his desire that we stay home in bedside baptist of course right now we're all in bedside baptist on some level because we can't go anywhere uh, but it's not God's will that we say, oh, I don't have to be connected because I got a relationship with God. I, I don't need to go to church because that doesn't line up scripture. Okay. We saw that Jesus went to church. So he gave us by example. It was his custom, as, as the scripture said. All right. What does the church look like? Romans 12. We were talking about how the church um, has many parts to it. We looked at Romans 12, 1 through 5, 1 Corinthians 12 and 27. And we saw it was the, the church is like the like your physical body. There's many parts, and each part has a different function. We're the body of Christ. And of course, he is the head, but we make up all the different parts and we all have different callings and different purposes, or well, not purpose, because we all have one purpose to advance his kingdom, but our callings are different. Our, the way he deals with each of us is different. Um, and so each of us has uh, been given a, a, a measure of faith, the word of God says. Okay. All right. We are many, but we make up one. And we, I threw the question out, how do we differ from a marriage? And uh, someone, I believe it was Shirley, had said we are like a marriage because we're in a relationship, a covenant, if you will. And in that sense, we are. Of course, the two become one flesh. We're not into that. But we are in a relationship that knits us together in a covenant as part of the body of Christ. So when one part of us is out of order, then all of us are out of order. If one part hurts, the scripture says, or suffers, then all of us suffer. So we got to 1 Corinthians 12. I think this is where I stopped, if I recalled correctly. 1 Corinthians 12. Let's see here. Uh, somebody asked the question because the scripture says to each one of us in Romans 12, 3, that each man has been given a measure of faith. Um, do we all get the same measure of faith? And, you know, there's some different views on that. The essence of it is if you look at it in context, it's given God gave you what you need to perform in the function he called you to perform in. 
So if I'm a toe, I may need a different kind of juice than I need if I'm a finger versus if I'm an ear. But from the scriptural standpoint, everyone is given faith because it's by grace you're saved through faith. And this not of yourself, it's a gift of God. So everybody's given faith. The distinction in, in our callings and in our uh, particular giftings, uh, that faith is going to line up with that. The key is all of us have the opportunity to grow our faith. As I mentioned before, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As we exercise our faith, as, as even our faith is, is tested, you know, as, as the word of God tells us, account it all joy when we fall into diverse challenges because ultimately it will mature us. Uh, as we meditate on the word, of course, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, all these are means in which we get to grow our faith. And as our faith is put to the test, of course, like a muscle, the more I use it, the more it grows. And then we say, who decides what part you are? Who decides where you belong in the truth? We looked at, <clears throat> excuse me, 1 Corinthians 12. Let me start reading from 12 again. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, it is therefore not of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, it is therefore not of the body. Or is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the uh, hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members of each one in a body just as what he pleased. So we don't decide where we fit in the body of Christ. God has determined and given us a calling and given us a, a particular function within the body. Okay? And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Then we went down to 1221. All right, let's keep reading. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. Verse 21, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head or to the feet, I have no need of you. No much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary as those members of the body which we think be which we think to be less honorable. On these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part, to that part with which lacks it, that there should be no schisms in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. So we don't treat, should not treat somebody who has a more prominent, you know, outgoing or obvious or visual role as being more important than another person. According to God, we are all one and we are all significant. And so therefore, he said there should be no schism, no division, no, no, uh, if you will, di uh, discrimination in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. So we should be loving each other caring for each other, no matter who we are, because we are all important to God. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer. We talked about that. So if I'm out of order, I'm out of place, then the body's out of place. Just like if my shoulder gets out of order, my body is not going to function in equilibrium. So some of us have been MIA. We've been gone, missing in action, doing our own thing, sometimes out of woundedness, we pull back, but what we don't recognize is that because God placed us as he desired, when we get out, out of place, then the whole body's out of place. So when one of us suffers, all of us suffer. That means all of us should be reaching out to minister one to another and encourage, as it says, care for one another. But it also means I can't have just a selfish view that says it's all about me because it's not all about me. Verse 27. 
Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, help, administrations, variety of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So my function in the body, predetermined by God, my measure of faith, if you will, correlates with whatever it is that God has created and called me to do in the sense that um, we have a measure of faith that's necessary to achieve whatever it is that God gave us. And I believe, like I said, that he give, we know the scripture tells us he gives each of us faith, but as we grow into our gifting and our calling, that faith continues to grow in a proportionate to um, us operating in that function that God has created us to operate in. It's very important then that I know who I am in Christ, that I know my calling, that I know my gifting. A lot of people, I believe, are out of joint. When I say that, they're a shoulder trying to be a knee. They're a knee trying to be a foot. And therefore brings confusion into the body of Christ. Um, because I'm a big wig on my job, I think I'm supposed to be a big wig when I get involved in the kingdom of God. But that is not the correlation. It is what did God call me to be? I know a man of God who's a powerful, powerful, anointed man, man of God, and he's actually a janitor. So in the natural, if you will, you would look and say, well, wow, he's not quote unquote all that. And yet he's a powerful man of God. So God is not concerned about those temporal things. It is that we operate in our calling and in our gifting according to God's will for us. And so we have a responsibility to learn, to grow, to seek his face so we can know our place in the body of Christ. And I'm convinced that because we don't often know our place, we're easily discouraged, easily uh, jealous, uh, envious of someone else being used by God because we're not where we're supposed to be. We're not doing what God called us to do. We're not pursuing our own calling and, and, and uh, understanding our place in the body of Christ. Anytime that you're busy staring at somebody else and worrying about what they have, that means that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, handling your own business. But how many people spend time fretting over other people, worrying about what they got, what they don't got, how they act, who's giving them shine, as, they, as the youngest would say, you know, who's paying attention to them? Is the pastor talking about them? Why are they getting all their attention? instead of focusing on who you're called to be. One of the things I know about God from personal experience is there are seasons in a person's life as you walk with God, there's seasons like uh, Jeremiah say, he's the potter with the clay. You know, in the pottery, in the natural realm, they take the clay and they shape it. They put it in a hot, hot furnace to get all the impurities out. That's long before it ever get used to do anything. God might have you in that furnace right now, smelting you and getting the junk out and getting the dross out, as the scripture says, getting the dirt out, getting the crumbs out, getting the uneven levels out. He works through all of those things. Uh, Bishop Perrin, who, who was uh, instrumental in helping me understand my calling, he was my pastor. He said, God has to do a whole lot for you before he can do a whole lot through you. In other words, He's got to do a lot to you before he can get much through you. He got to deal with you, clearing you out. That's why Paul says, lay hands suddenly on no man. In other words, let's not exalt anybody too quickly to be in any particular office. Let God deal with them to be who they, to be shaped and molded into the character of Christ so that they then are equipped and ready to stand in their place in whatever capacity God has called them in the body. So when you are not pursuing and learning and growing in who you are, you got time to be bitter. You got time to be a busybody. You got time to be uh, getting up in everybody else's business, getting on everybody else's nerves. Uh, I think I quoted this 
in this class before because it's one of the scripture I often quote, and that's in John chapter four, when Jesus was confronting uh, the lady at the well, the Samaritan. Let me turn there real quick. I'm taking a little bit of a detour, but I believe it's right in alignment with what God would have me to share. In John chapter four, if you remember, he said, I need to go through Samaria. Uh, even though it wasn't really on his way to where he was going because God had an ordained appointment for him to meet with a woman at the well. And you know her story. She'd been married a whole bunch of times and he told her all about her business. And she like, how you know that? You're a prophet, all that. Bottom line is it came to a point where she finally believed on him and then she wouldn't tell everybody. He told me everything I ever did. And of course, all the men was like, everything? <laughs> Praise God. But when the disciples got back, because the disciples had gone to town to get something to eat, and he come, they come back, he's talking to his woman. You know, we don't, priests don't talk to women, didn't talk to women at that time. So that's out of order. But two, they said, well, Rabbi, eat something. And he said something that was so profound, it changed my life. Because it redirected my focus away from people and pettiness and foolishness to who am I? Look at verse 34 later when you jot it down, John chapter 4, 34. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. See, when you know your food, doing God's will, you are content, you are full in him and you don't have room for foolishness. You don't have room to be worrying about what Sally Sue and Jack and Jill, Jill are doing and what they ain't doing and criticizing this one and that one. When you are walking in your purpose and in your place in the kingdom of God, your place in the body of Christ, you don't worry about anybody else because you have a fullness and a contentment. And it's my contention that so many people in the body of Christ are empty that they have time to be involved with foolishness because they're not eating their food. They're not walking in their purpose. They're not walking in God's will. They don't even know God's will. They haven't pursued to even understand who they are. What are their gifts? What are they called? How do they fit into the body of Christ? All they're doing is coming to church looking for somebody to do something for them. And at some point, even a baby grows up to a place where they want to say, I could do it myself. You know, they start out, you know, here, let me do that for you. They all happy and content to let you do. At some point, they say, I can do it, mommy. And they start pushing you out of the way, trying to do it on their own. But some of us are just like big baby Hueys. We fat on the word, but we ain't doing nothing with it. If I'm talking about you, just say, ouch. If you're not walking in your gifts, not walking in your call, having pursued even to understand who you are, what part of the body of Christ you are, you're living beneath who you could be in Christ Jesus. And more importantly, you're not content. You're not full. You haven't eaten your food. You're empty on the inside trying to fill up with, well, if I go get hot, or oh, well, if I go get enough dresses, well, if I buy this big car, well, if I live in this house, you can get all that stuff and still be empty. How I know? Because I've been there and done that. Got the t-shirt and the sweatshirt and the hat. But guess what? None of that will bring you contentment in Christ. But when you get to that place where you understand your food, and you begin to walk in God's will for your life. There's a contentment. You talk about cloud nine. The temptation didn't even know what this is like. When you get in Christ, walking down, as Pastor like, Jenkins like to say, right downtown center of God's will street. I'm telling you, ain't no greater place to be than right there. Because when you do, you are content, you are full, you're not looking for somebody to affirm you all the time, they ain't got to stroke you and tell you how wonderful you are, you know who you are, God has already said amen, and you say praise be to God. Everything else is just gravy. But when we not clear about it, we oftentimes looking for others to feel in us what only God can feel to affirm in us what only God can affirm. Yes, men should be able to affirm that they see the gift, and that's part of the way you can uh, confirm God's word, because he said things shall be established by two or more witnesses. So God says amen, 
but also people will say amen and you should have an inner witness with the holy ghost so there should be a threefold witness but my point is when you're content in him you know that one week they could be saying hosanna hosanna the next week they could be saying crucify so you don't get too caught up in the hoopla when people start stroking you because the same crowd amen y'all done got me preaching up in here Lord have mercy so our roles are assigned by who by god that's our food that's what we've been called to do what happens when we leave our church and we touched on this briefly and we said when we leave the church we leave the church short we leave the church missing some pieces because we're not where we belong and when I want to revisit this briefly, because I don't want to say that every time you leave a local church, you're out of God's will, because sometimes that's what God will have you to do. But what I'm saying is when you're leaving out of flesh, you're leaving out of, oh, he get on my nerve. Or, I don't like the way he did so-and-so or she did such and so. That's not being led by the spirit. Then you're out of order. Only as the Lord leads, not because you had a conflict. Because guess what? Conflict is inevitable. Wherever two or more are gathered in his name, two or more are going to have a conflict. Because human beings, we have these treasures and jars of clay. We are not perfected yet. We are works in progress. We're still under construction. And therefore, you're going to fall short. They're going to fall short. But love covers a multitude of sin. We got to conquer. We got to overcome evil with good. We got to cover up everybody's shortcoming with love. So when we leave the church out of order, we leave the church out of order. It's in disorder. It's in dysfunction because we're not where we're supposed to be. Okay. So I was saying, name some ways we wound in the church. And we talked about this a little. People put it in the chat last week. I want to suggest to you, keep it with Paul's parallel on the natural body. Has anybody in here ever bitten your tongue, trying to chew too fast? Or you go get some Novocaine? That's the worst time. You get some Novocaine because they got a give you some kind of dental treatment, your face fill all fat, you can bite your tongue. You can bite the side of your mouth. How many said, oh, dang on it, my teeth bit my tongue, I'm getting rid of all my teeth, I'm leaving. How many said, tongue, you gotta go because you got in the way of my teeth. I don't think any of us would say anything so foolish. But yet when one of us gets bitten if you will what do we do we bail out what does the tongue and the teeth do what do they do when that collision happens they start all over again and they collaborate until they get it back in sync but what do we do we run we bail out we're gonna do our own thing we're not gonna buy i don't have to put up with this i can go to another church all you're doing is dragging to the next church your foolishness. Now you got other conflicts and can't figure out why. Because guess what the common denominator is? You. We have to learn to work through the word tells us how to do that. We somebody told you, you ever been walking and stump your toe? Good God am I. That's one of the ways I knew I was saved. <coughs> I gave my life to Christ. Uh, and I should say rededicated because I really believe that, you know, I, I know I made a commitment when I was younger, but nobody discipled me. And when I got in the world, did my own thing. And then when I rededicated, I stumped my toe. Like within a couple of days of giving my life, my heart back to Christ, so to speak, re refocusing, re renewing my relationship with him. I said, oh, shucks. And I looked around. Like, where did that come from? Somebody catch that in a minute. Because back in the day, a whole lot of stuff might have come out of my mouth, but it wouldn't have been all shucks. And that's when I knew God had done a work in me. 
because what normally would have come out, it was no longer there. God just supernaturally shifted me and my mouth was clean. Wasn't like when I was in kindergarten and little poor little Maurice used to curse in school and the teacher would take a bar of soap and wash his mouth out. Yeah. But Jesus, come on somebody, the blood of Jesus washed out my mouth and as soon as I stumped my toe, all that could come out was holy. That's when I knew God has done a work in me. Amen. But we didn't say, oh, I stumped my toe, I'm cutting this toe off. The toe didn't say, oh, I can't believe this big old body stumped me against the daggone floor like that. I'm leaving. That would be foolishness. Spiritually, yet, that's what we do. So what did we say? If one part of the body hurts, what happens? The whole body hurts. We're all suffering when one part of the body is suffering. So when we, let's see if I can move this. When we, when we are hurting, then we need to uh, recognize that we are all one. When one of us is hurting, all of us is hurting. Okay. Let's see. So James chapter three, verse number two. Let's look at that. James 3 and 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Of course, in this context, James is talking about the tongue and how it can be so vicious and how it can set a fire because we can say some stuff and cause all kind of chaos and we need to learn to bridle our tongue. My point in pointing this out though is, as it says, everybody stumbles. Nobody's perfect. We have this idolization of people in the church as though because they are prophets or preachers or teachers or or just go to church Sunday and look nice. We say, well, she's supposed to be a Christian. Well, he's supposed to be. And we hold people to a standard that nobody can meet. Don't get me wrong. We have to give an account when we mistreat one another. God is not pleased with that. So I'm not excusing inappropriate behavior. But I'm also challenging us to come up higher in the Lord and stop expecting perfection from a human being. No human being is going to be perfect. I don't care how much they love God. I don't care how much you love them. They are not going to be perfect. It's impossible for anybody to reach that standard until we are all in Christ Jesus resurrected. Okay. So when we look at this, we need to look at it soberly with the eyes of God. How do you want God to see you when you mess up? Do you want him to throw you away? Do you want him to look at you and say, um, uh, she's no good. Uh, he's just not worth it anymore. I, I'm wasting my time. Is that how we want God to look at us? Surely not. Surely we want God to show us grace. But how, about, how many of us are willing to show somebody else that grace? I see a couple of questions. You can keep typing your questions. I'm going to get to them. I'm going to try to get through this, hopefully. Lord Jesus, scream like time is flying. Okay, look at James 4.11. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? 
In other words, God is saying, I'm the only one in a posture to be able to judge somebody. You don't have that ability. You don't have that right. Jesus said, don't judge and you won't be judged. If you don't want that, don't give it out because you're going to reap what you sow. It's funny how when we're looking at our shortcomings, we always want people to understand our heart. God understands. He know what I've been through. You don't know my story. We always got a reason why we should be given compassion. But when we look at somebody else, for some reason, we say, they should know better. They supposed to be this and they that and they that. We have a whole different attitude when it's somebody else. Why is that? With the same measure you use the word of God, there's a principle in the scripture. The measure you use towards somebody else is the same measure is going to be measured back to you. You ought to be walking so humbly. Because I don't know about you, but I, I don't have any room to be judging anybody. I need grace. So all I'm trying to do is give out grace. And when I catch myself, oftentimes I do. I'm like, Lord, forgive me and help me. Because <laughs> I know good and well that I need all the grace I can get. One of the things that I learned, even being a prison chaplain, it showed me a lot about people. Because people would say, ooh, how you work with all them prisoners? They did this and they did that. And what was really shocking was when I say, they're no different from you or they're no different from us. They just made a mistake and got caught. The bigger thing that God showed me though was he shows us grace every day. Brand new mercies are given to us every day. But for his mercies, we would be consumed. So how do we dare not give somebody else some grace? So we don't want to be walking around judging. And especially, let me get my plug in, leaders. We have flaws like everybody else. Yes, we have to hold ourselves accountable because God's going to hold us accountable. He said, don't presume to be a teacher because you're going to be judged more harshly. So I'm not saying you can say, oh, well, it's okay. They can just do any old thing. No, I'm simply saying that's still a human being. I don't care what title, I don't care what collar, I don't care what church, I don't care where they are. Short of Jesus, every human being sins. So consequently, we have to bear that in mind because otherwise what we do is we put people up on this pedestal so when they fall, we go whoop right with them because we're so exalted. That's, that's really idolatry. We've so exalted them that we think they're just perfect and they can't make a mistake. And the truth is, that's a lie. That's why the word of God tells us to pray for our leaders. 1 Timothy 5.13, let's look at that. Trying to get through here, Lord Jesus, help me. Help me. 1 Timothy 5.13 says, and besides, I'm going to go back to 11. But refuse the younger widows, because they're talking about um, women who are widows and who should be taken care of in the church. It said, refuse the younger widows, but for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And verse 13, and besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies saying things which they ought not. And I put this in this context because, again, sometimes we are so caught up in gossip and being busybodies and, and nitpicking and backbiting and all of that, that we stir up dissension in the church. We create situations where people get hurt. Somebody confides in you something, something that they've gone through, and next thing they know, you out there telling the world. It should not be so. People should be able to come to you in confidence and know that you will maintain that confidence. You shouldn't be running around talking, girl, did you hear? Ooh, I heard she did such and so. Oh, I'm, I'm not gossiping. I'm just telling you so you can pray about it. You know you lying. The devil is a liar. You gossip it. If you wanted me to pray about it, you would come to me and say, can you touch and agree with me about something very confidential? Because I'm this burden in my heart or whatever. You didn't come to me. Girl, oh, I can't believe. No, that's gossip. Your motivation is what determines why uh, or whether it's gossip. 
And if you're not doing it to edify, you're not doing it in a right way. Many things that I've observed that I'd never repeat to anybody other than God. I pray. I see something in a person. I see something they're struggling with. And they'll come back to me later. And then I've had it happen where they come back to me like they think I'm going to be shocked when they tell me this or that, this shortcoming they have or that shortcoming they have. And I'm, I already saw it. The whole spirit showed that to me, you know, when I met you or whatever. And I've started praying for you. I don't have to go around talking about you. I can talk to God to help you get delivered. But instead, and nothing more painful than when you see me falling short, and instead of praying for me, encouraging me, you run around talking about me. That'll cause some hurt right there. And many of us are guilty. So we have to check ourselves. Look at Ephesians 4.29. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Is what's coming out of your mouth, is it imparting grace? Is it edifying? If you can't say yes to those, then don't say it. Just pray it. That sounds like a t-shirt right there. Mm -hmm. Don't say it, just pray it. <laughs> Go to God in prayer. Intercede for that person. Go to them in love if you see somebody messed up. But just to be criticizing or talking about people or whatever, if it's not edifying, just don't say it. It should be imparting grace. Look at verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You know, the, God, the Lord God in you is grieved when we do that. I always picture him in a corner of my house, all cowered up in a knot because he can't be free when I'm walking in sin. Look at Ephesians 6, 12. We know this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's the answer to half the questions right there. It is not flesh and blood that you're warring with. It is the spirit that's trying to operate in that person. The spirits that are stirring up right now, the spirit of division is rampant in our country. And that kind of hell is breaking loose because people are walking in division and, and buying into racism and buying into hate and all kinds of things because we are allowing ourselves to be duped by the spirits that are not of the spirit of the living God. We're allowing ourselves to be used by the enemy. And he's laughing at us, I'm sure. But we should be worn in the spirit, not with people. The greatest challenge to me as a believer is not Oh, how can I throw that person away? It is how can I win their soul? What greater testimony than when you have a person who's walking in a way that's seemingly against you, that your testimony and your witness and your love drives out the hell that's in them. And suddenly, instead of being able to say, I lost somebody, I won somebody. That's a great testimony because you recognize that they are lost. They are bound in a particular area of their lives. And you don't have to be like a heathen, like, oh, I, that person don't know God at all. No, everybody has different pockets, strongholds that you have in your mind where you are not walking in a clear understanding of God's will in that particular area of your life. You could be a great this or a great that and be a terrible this or a terrible that. Think of it in the natural. You can be a great parent. You can be a great husband, great wife, and yet be a terrible student. One doesn't negate the other. You just got to study and be a better student. And so likewise, in the spirit realm, just because somebody has a struggle in one area, 
we don't just write them off as they are no good, but that's how we tend to do. We just see things strictly black and white, but that's not how God operates. Look at Proverbs 16, 28. <clears throat> Proverbs 16, 28. A perverse man's soul strikes a, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. I'm putting all this in here because I'm trying to show us how sometimes our behavior that we think is not that big a deal has caused people to be hurt. Well, we are not being mindful that we are allowing the enemy to use us to be a destructive force in the body of Christ. We are causing people to be hurt and we are causing dysfunction in the body of Christ. We so strife. We whisper and talk about this one and talk about that one and tell this one what this one said. We separate close friends. All that's carnal. All that's of a spirit that's not of the spirit of the Lord. And if we're not careful, we will allow ourselves to be duped and used by the enemy. Look at Proverbs 26 and 20. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. That is profound and yet simple. Just like natural wood. If you, if you got a fire going and you keep putting wood, it'll keep burning. You stop putting wood, it'll just go out. If you stop stirring up the confusion, if you stop taking the bone and getting another bone and bringing it back to this one and telling this one what she said this about you and all that craziness, we should not be busybodies. We should not be gossipers. We should not be destructive in the way that we deal with people. We got to deal with people in love and in gentleness, lest we be used by the enemy to bring about strife. Watch this. Where there's no tail bearer, strife pieces. My uncle used to say, anybody who will bring a bone or take a bone. Meaning they come to you with gossip, they're going to probably go talk about you to somebody else. That's how it usually works. That same person. And then they'll say, well, they, and this is the part that gets me. They go back and tell the part you said, but they don't mention what they said. They say, yeah, girl, she said you, da 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 da, da. Now you, you whatever, then she go tell you, oh, girl, she said, now you got a bunch of foolishness going on. Somebody got to be wise enough to say, I'm not putting another piece of wood in that fire. I will not stoke it another minute. Y'all can go on that journey all by yourself. I'm not taking that trip. Somebody's got to be mature enough to be the adult in the room. And honestly, I think a lot of what we're dealing with is a lack of maturity when not because the person didn't do something wrong, but because how we handled it was immature oftentimes. Now, we're going to get into a little bit more, but let me finish this part. Colossians 3 and 8. Colossians 3 and 8. Let me see if I can run them. Ooh, 758. Colossians 3, 8. Says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. I cannot be accountable for you, but I got to be accountable for me. I can't excuse my behavior by saying you made me do anything. She made me so angry. He made me cut. Nobody can make you do anything unless you've made them your God. Because anything or anyone that you exalt above God in your life is now your God, your idol, your little G God. But the true and living God always brings peace. So that means you need to fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of your faith, and take your eyes off of that little G God. If they're out of order, you don't have to be out of order with them. And you certainly don't want to walk in these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. 
If those are things you struggle with, then go before God, get counseling, do what you got to do, because you bring all that drama into the kingdom of God and sow discord and people get hurt and you get hurt. And now we got a bunch of broken people and we're supposed to be ministering to the world, but we so busy biting and tearing up each other, we can't go out and minister to anybody. Luke 6.45. Luke 6.45. Luke 6.45. Okay. Says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. What that tells me is garbage in, garbage out. If I want to be in a person that God can use, a person that can walk in peace regardless of what's going on, I got to put in things to, to keep my heart right with God. I can't let your poison be my God. So I got to keep my mind renewed in the word. I got to keep praying up. I got to keep filling myself up, with the, myself up with the things of God so that then I, in turn, will speak life out of my mouth regardless of what you're saying. Because notice what it doesn't say. Out of the ear, the mouth speaks. It says out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if I keep my heart filled up with the things of God, and that means also being wise about my close confidants, uh, my friends, that my inner circle, Jesus always kept the three with him. Some stuff he said, nope, only those three can go in. He had the inner court. He had the outer court, so to speak. He had the most holy of holies, the inner court and the outer court. You had Peter and John and James, and then you had the rest of them 12, and then you had everybody else. You know, you have to have a certain level that only certain people can get to. Everybody shouldn't have full access to everything. Because when you do, what happens is people who didn't have any business that close to your heart end up wounding your heart at another level. And consequently, you are uh, not at your best and you end up with church hurt. I'm not saying that because you're close to somebody, because look, Peter had to be rebuked by Jesus and he was his right hand man. So that means you're not going to get hurt just because the person loves you or you're close to them. Because the truth be told, the people who are closest to us can hurt us the most because we care about them the most. And they're human and you're human. So you're going to still fall short. But that should be a circle that only so many people can get in. Everybody you walk in love toward, but everybody shouldn't be in your innermost place, your innermost circle. And lastly, let's look at Galatians 5.15. Galatians 5.15. And these are all ways that we cause hurt. And I wanted to lay this part of the foundation because I want us to look at ourselves before we look at others. And we're going to shift to look at how we deal with it when people hurt us. But I want us to make sure we're not the source of other people's hurt. We might need to do some repenting because we allow the enemy to use us to hurt others unbeknownst or unwittingly. But this is critical because remember, we're the body of Christ and the body of Christ is supposed to be one. We, ba we battle flesh, not flesh and blood, but spiritual, in the spiritual realm. If we aren't on one accord, a house divided cannot stand. Look at verse number 15, chapter five of Galatians. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. We're so busy coming at each other, taking each other down. It'd be like a football team where instead of the defense defending the ball, the defense start attacking his own offense. That's what we're like. We are going up against each other instead of warring against the enemy who is the real source of the problem. Instead of coming together and binding the works of the hands of the enemy, we're coming at each other and we're devouring each other. And so what does that make the body of Christ? Oftentimes weak in the eyes of the world. In the eyes of the world, we're ineffective because we are 
dysfunctional because we're not operating A in our gift, we're not walking in our particular role, and then B, we're attacking and devouring each other. And that's a sad state because the Holy Spirit, again, is grieved because he gave us a charge to love one another. And this is the opposite of what he called us to do. So how should we handle church hurt? We get hurt. First thing is, like I said, and like the word of God tells us, we are to walk in love. You notice, if you've been to a wedding, there's a good chance somebody read this scripture. It's funny how we do all the things in church. You know, we got all of the trappings of it, but then we don't live it. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have a gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. What does God call us to? And this, is, this ain't for the babies. I'm going to be real with you. This is for people who want to truly walk in purpose in Christ Jesus. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So when I'm encountering church hurt, one of the things I have to do is check myself and say, Lord, help me to honor you so that I walk in love no matter what that person has done. And that's real because that means I got to die to myself. I got to put aside my agenda to take up my cross and follow him. And that means he Even sometimes I got to do it wounded. Somebody said, what happens when they keep doing it over and over again? You know, I, I, I forgave them. I walked in love. I want us to look again at verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Again. If I'm going to walk with God, at some point, my emotions cannot be my God. I got to walk as an adult. How many have children? How many of them children then got on your nerve at one point or another? You wanted to choke them at, or at least consider going to jail and doing prison ministry. <laughs> How many left their, put their kids out because they said, oh, they just got on my nerve. I can't take it no more. I'm, I'm getting rid of them. No, you didn't do that because you love them. You comfort them with love. You, you, bear, you bared with them. You, you long suffered with them. You, you tolerated them out of love. That's what God is calling us to do as a body of Christ. If we're truly his body and we see ourselves as one of these parts, we can't rip apart every time something happens that hurts us. We got to go before the Lord our God and we got to follow the steps that he's given us. Let's look at it. He says, ooh, did I go? How should we handle church hurt? Like I skip one. Let's see. Okay. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. No, one was love to was grow up three is be reconciled let's look at matthew chapter 18 because somebody said well how do you deal with it when a person hurts you god always has an answer he has a word for us and the steps are right here in his word how do we deal with it he says in matthew 18 verse 15 moreover if your brother sins against you, go and tell him. Stop right there. 
Don't go tell Jack, John, Sally, Sue, Apollonia them. Go tell him. How many times does somebody come to me where well, so-and-so said you did this or so-and-so? I almost want to scream. Why are you telling me that? They ain't coming to tell me themselves. But that's what we do. We don't go woman up, man up, and tell the person. We go tell other people. He said, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone. How many know alone means alone? Nobody else. No three, no four, no five. Two people alone. Those only two people should know about that fault. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. And this works out even in other contexts. You get a coworker who messed up. You gonna put them on blast? Let me tell the boss. Look how they messed up. Or you gonna go to that person and say, look, um, I was looking at so-and-so and it looks like you might need to make some adjustments. You have won your brother. You have won your sister. They will remember that because one day you're going to need somebody to have your back. It works in marriage. It works with your children. Don't go and put it on blast. Go to that person alone. If he, uh, verse 16, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. What does that mean? We're going to get a couple of people who are righteous to go with us to listen and to give a righteous answer. You, you know, brothers, sisters, you know, what I'm hearing is you're not lining up with God's word. Here's what the word of God says. Can we pray? Because that's not God's way. Not to go in there like you brought your gang. Yeah, we here because you messed up and we can't tell you about yourself. That That's not God. Now you take a godly counsel. What does Psalm 1 say? We don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. We walk in peace. We walk in love. We walk in wisdom. Those two witnesses should be mature people in the Lord who can say, yeah, I, I can bear witness. You know, here's what I see based on what I'm hearing. So that that person, again, gets another chance. You've tried it by yourself. Now you're trying it with two believers who love God, who are gentle in nature, not coming and hacking but being honest, and they are trying to win that person over. What happens? Verse 17, and if he refuses to hear them, now you don't try it by yourself, you took some godly people, then you tell it to the church. What does that mean? Leadership. If you were in a ministry, you would go to the head of that minister. Ministry, if it's a situation where it's appropriate, you go to that pastor or, or elder or whoever. Uh, your structure is depending on the circumstance. Uh, but you've done everything you know to do. You've prayed, you've gone to them, you've talked with others, and they still won't listen. Now you go to the leader. This person is out of order, won't receive. Okay. Verse 17 If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. <coughs> now, <coughs> Somebody might hear that as, oh, well, you can just spit them out the mouth. They ain't important. But I want you to look at it as, how did Jesus deal with the tax collectors? How did Jesus deal with the heathens? He witnessed to them. He loved them. He drew them. We don't step on them and say, oh, they scum of the earth. We now turn and say, this person is lost. They need the Lord. And if nothing else, in this area of their lives. So we're going to now treat them like an unbeliever. A person who don't know God, who don't know no better, so that we can try to win this person because they are lost. So we're going to preach the word, encourage them, pray for them, and do whatever God will show us to do to try to win them. Verse 18 says, As surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. <clears throat> Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth, Concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or more are gathered, two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. So what if those witnesses you took with you started being your prayer warriors and, and prayer partners and y'all begin to intercede and y'all begin to bind whatever that thing is operating in that person's life? 
and loosen them from the grip of the enemy as opposed to attacking them and throwing them away. Okay. All right. So we have to forgive. I keep throwing like I'm going to keep throwing. Maybe I didn't. We have to forgive. Oh, that's why I did skip some. Um, I just read Matthew 18 in part, but um, I'm going to end with Matthew 18, 21. And I'm gonna, I encourage you to read this whole, all these verses, 18, 21, and 35. But in some, Peter came to Jesus after he had just taught him how to be reconciled. He said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? That's what somebody just put in the question. How many times I got to take this? They keep doing the same thing. He said, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? What did Jesus say? I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times, seven times. In other words, as long as he keep messing up, keep forgiving him. Now, he goes into a discourse and we'll have to pick up that next week. But the essence of it is, God forgives you every single time you messed up. Do you want him to say, well, it's been seven times um, I'm done forgiving you. Is that what you want him to measure you with? Because with the same measure you use, he said he's going to measure it back to you. So the question is, how often do you want God to forgive you? And we're going to pick up there next week. Because we not only need to look at forgiving others, but we need to look at forgiving ourselves. Because sometimes the struggle is right here in me. Or as Bishop Jake says, the enemy is in a me. So we want to deal with that. But I want you to meditate on that. Matthew 18, 21 to 35, Ephesians 4, 32. And we'll come back next week and deal with that. Amen. So let me see if I can... Uh, Let's see. Let's see if I can look at a couple of these questions here. I know I saw the one about what if a person keeps doing it over and over. Now, one of the things I haven't really jumped into yet, but I'll mention is, again, it's not a sin to leave a church. It doesn't mean that because I'm part of the body of Christ, I can never leave this church because, you know, then I would be out of order. The question is, what is my motivation? God always looks at my heart. Is this what God would have me to do? It shouldn't be some people shouldn't be church hopping. You, if I say what church, well, I used to go here, then I went here, and that doesn't. How many times are you going to get married? At some point, you got to settle in. If God led you there, he's going to keep you there. This is the key. Is this where God led you? Or did you just pick a church because it was convenient to get to and get back home? I remember I was um, at a church for 22 years. Met my husband there. I married, had my kids there. Became a minister there, all that. But it came to a point where I was grieving in my spirit. I believe the Lord was saying, it's time to move. And I remember telling my husband what I thought and he was like ah, nah, it's no different wherever we go blah 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 so I sat still for a couple of years a few years waiting for God to get it you know Mary had to wait for Joseph to get the word that's another preacher but anyway when he finally got it we left and we came to First Baptist but we were visiting different churches because you know I wanted the Lord to speak and say okay Father show us where to go I knew where I wasn't going. Bad Size Baptist wasn't going to be my church. But 22 years, that was like a divorce. I mean, I had all of my spiritual maturity and, and growth and cutting my teeth was in that church. It shouldn't be something you can just hop from one week to this here, you here next week and that. No. How you going to grow like that? You wouldn't take your child to one kindergarten class one week, two weeks here, three weeks there. That child would be all crazy. Some of us are all crazy because we keep getting fed in 1,200 different places. You need to settle down. Let the Holy Spirit show you. As we move from place just visiting, 
each time we would end up back here at First Baptist. And then finally I said, I believe this is where God has called us to. And he bore witness, my husband bore witness, and we ended up sitting there for a year, listening and letting God minister. Because I was, I'll be honest with you, I told Pastor Jenkins, you had to give me spirit to spirit resuscitation. I was so wounded. I've been through church hurt. But I was wounded because, well, we don't go there. Bottom line is, I knew that God had told me to move, but I had to wait so that I could do it in a unified way. But I also had to wait for him to speak. This is where you're supposed to be. I'm not going to go house to house to house to house. I'll visit, but I, I mean, we went to Largo, we went to Evangel, we went, but eventually we would always end up back here. And I just knew God was saying this. And then I looked back and realized, what, Pastor been speaking in my life for 15 years because I listened to him every Saturday on the radio. So it wasn't like it was a new voice. Okay, let's look at any other questions um what what if no one in the church that you hmm? what if you have no one in the church that you can take with you that means you're not connected in that church um you should be involved in ministry that's what goes back to us knowing who we are in the body connecting according to what we have been called to do in the body if we're doing that then we there's no way you don't have anybody in relationship with if you are what i call a, a stop by drive through christian you run in time to hear the word and then get out before the traffic you're not doing what god called you to do you should be making connections you should be involved with ministry you should be connecting with other christians and developing what did the word say we saw it he called us to come together to stir one another on the good works how are you gonna do that if you don't make any relationship how are you gonna do that if you don't talk to anybody and some of us come just to see what god gonna tell us this week so we can get, get our spiritual fix for the week but we're not interested in serving god we're not interested in being involved in ministry pastor up there begging you can you get involved with ministry but you ain't got time you're busy but as soon as something come down, who where you go? My church, they supposed to do this for me and they supposed to do that. Well, who is the church? Where's the church? Let's see, uh, does a witness have to be somebody from the church? There should be somebody uh, certainly in Christ. I mean, ideally from the same local fellowship, but certainly a mature person in Christ. You don't just take somebody who ain't even connected with the body of Christ up in there. You're gonna have a mess. Pastors and leadership were the ones who turned their <coughs> backs. How do you, how do you heal from? So if the pastors turn their back, how do you heal from that? If I'm reading this correctly, here's again where I go with this. I've got to be prayerful about what church I'm in, first of all, because I need to be where God would have me to be, and be. When I know I'm where I'm supposed to be, I can go to God and he'll deal with their heart. Because he said, when a righteous man, when you live in a way that's pleasing to God, he'll make your enemy live at peace with you. How much more your pastor? Now, what if you said, well, I've done all I can do and I just don't feel like I can connect. I believe that if it's the right time for you to go, the spirit of God will confirm that for you and show you where to go. You don't just go wander aimlessly forever. Like I ain't gonna never join a church because I've been hurt. That's not God. You should be planted and covered under somebody's covering. If that passes out of order, maybe God is dealing with them. I remember my pastor getting mad at me. Because God, on more than one occasion, I remember going to my pastor um, uh, and saying, I believe the Lord says so and so, but I'd be so nervous. And so I was a babe, especially back then. I was like, Lord Jesus, this person going to kill me. How am I tell him that? <clears throat> but like he told uh, Timothy, don't let him despise you because he can you. Just do what I said. I say all that to say, if I'm where I'm supposed to be, I gotta be like, what he tell uh, Ezekiel? You gotta set your set your face like Flint. You you can't be wishy washy. You gotta do what I told you to do. Um, and. When we are being led by the spirit, that's the key. Then we'll flow. Even when other people are out of order, 
when you're filled with the spirit and you know you're filled with God, you will have an inner peace and hell could be bringing loose around you, but you'll be walking in that peace. And that's why it all comes down to knowing that you're where you're supposed to be. Now, I don't want to be in a church where I can't honor the pastor and see God in. for me. Now, this is personal, so I ain't trying to say this is for everybody. One of my struggles with my current president is I can't see the character of God in him. It's hard for me to follow him when I see all of these things that seem inconsistent with what he's spouting out of his mouth. I don't want to be on a pastor where I'm looking and seeing, hearing one thing and seeing another. I'm going to struggle with that. I'm not looking for perfection because I can look at my current past and, and point out some imperfection just like he could do in me. But I'm looking for the power of God in him and the love of God in him because when he gets out of order, guess what? I can go to the king of kings and he will redirect him and get him right back in order because the Holy Ghost is in him. But if I can't have that kind of confidence, it's the same thing in marriage. She said, don't be equally yoked. Don't be under no man that he all in his flesh and you can't pray and, and God won't redirect his heart because his heart's so hard. You want to be in a relationship with a pastor, a ministry, a leadership, a people who um, are walking according to God's will and doing what God called them to do. So again, if they out of order, we pray them right back on in line, just like a GPS. Okay. What if you have forgotten the person that hurt you in church, but you having trouble with you when you see that person? It sounds like they're saying if you somebody hurt you, but you see them now, you still kind of get stirred up. Then you haven't forgiven them. Read Ephesians four and thirty-two. What's the standard? How do you want God to treat you? Do you want him to curl up every time he see you? Every time you come to the throne with your prayer, God go, Ooh, you hurt me, you, you sinned. Is that what you want? Because I ain't what I want. So I'm saying to you, do what you want God to do to you. Okay? From Angela Terry, I mean, okay. Hey, AG. Um. Again, go back to God, ask him to first heal your heart, and then ask him to help you forgive. I had a situation that was so hurtful. I mean, woo, that thing hurt. I had to pray hard, and I had to say, God, help me to forgive. God didn't say, you should, it's a good idea. He commanded us to forgive. If you want to be forgiven, you got to forgive. But sometimes pain is real. So whenever God tells us to do something, he always equips us to do it. So what do I do? If I'm lacking, what do you say? Ask. So I pray, I ask, Lord, help me. Because I went to uh, Philippians 3, 13. He said, forget what's behind you. I couldn't forget it, Lord. It's hurting too much. Then you need to come before me and get some more grace. You need to pray. You need to seek my faith. Sometimes you have to get counsel. You have to let somebody walk you through that pain and talk it out. Godly counsel. Saints in the Lord, seasoned women. That's why Titus 2 said a younger trainer, uh, the older trainer, younger. Or you can go outside and get a, a professional Christian counselor. But either way, sometimes you have to go beyond just the prayer. <coughs> we talked about what to do when it keeps happening. He said you got to keep forgiving. And then we got to check in with God, make sure I'm in the right place. Being released, what are your thoughts about being released by the spirit and being obedient? I'm not sure I understand that question. Is it okay for married people to go to different churches? My opinion, not. Here's why. Would you go out to dinner on Sunday and say, honey, you go over there and eat at Red Robins and I'm gonna eat over here at Long Home? Heck to the no, you're not going to do that. Y'all walking in fellowship, you want to eat the same meal, you want to embrace and be able to hear the same words so you're under the same cover and the same teaching. Do people do it? Yeah, they do it. And I'm not going to criticize because that is, I'm not God, I can't judge. I'm just telling you my belief is the two become one is what the word is good. So if they become one, half of them is over there in the church here and half of them is over there, but they're one. So in God's eyes, in my mind, that's a little confusion and dysfunctional. But I know people that do it. Bless them. You know, I'm just saying. That's why I didn't leave my forever church. I sat there for almost three years until God spoke the same thing 
to him to my husband. So when we left, we left. But I know people who rolled out and left their husband there. I just don't don't think that's the way I wanted to. That wasn't how I wanted to do it. Um, I think I got the majority. Let's see. Hopefully I did. Uh, we out of time anyway. Um, but I wanted to try to hit the majority. The thing about leaders is they're, they're healed. I mean, they need healing just like you. They might hurt people, hurt people. So they might be dealing with some inner hurts, rejection that they have experienced. There's all kinds of reasons people hurt people. Sometimes they just plain all out of order. And you have to pray for them that God would turn their situation around. Um, but also keep your heart open to the Lord so he can show you. If this is where you're supposed to be in this season of your life, and if you're not, it's okay to say, I believe the Lord has told me to move on. But here's what I don't believe. I don't believe God tell you to move every two weeks, every other week. Well, they ain't do this I like. Or every year, I got a new church. I don't believe God is like that. God is a God that's the same today, yesterday, and forever. He's stable in his ways. He's not unstable. So if you always church hopping, I don't Again, just my belief, I don't believe you're hearing God. I believe you're following your flesh and your emotions. What if we cause the hurt, apologize, but the person refused to communicate? Guess what? You have no control over that. You pray for that person. You apologize. You were sincere. Then I believe God honors your apology, and you just leave that in the hand of God. I had a situation like that. I had done all I knew to do to reconcile. The person was, uh, I said, you know what? I'm going to let God judge between you and me. You know, in the Old Testament, they say, you, God, you judge between us. I'm, I've done all I know to do. He said, as much as it depends on you live at peace with all men, you don't have control over what anybody else does. It's as much as you can do. If you've done all you can do, then you've done all you can do. In some instances, you shake the dust off your feet and keep it moving. Some instances, the relationship may be important enough that you keep praying. I had a situation in my family. I prayed for about three, four, five years before that thing got reconciled. So it just depends. Some things you're going to invest more time in than others just because they're more important than others. Okay. Um, we have to go. It's 831. I'm still talking. What did this one say? Um, because we want to honor the time. I know this is one of them topics. It's a hot topic. I was getting questions like crazy. Um, so uh, this, we have one more week of class. Next week is our last week before we break for the winter. We try to flow in the um, same uh, time frame as Pastor Jenkins because we are a general Bible study unlike other women's focus studies that have like 16 weeks or 10 or 5 or whatever because we topically jump from topic to topic just like he does. Hopefully when I come back next Monday I'll have a firm date for when we come back. I may not. If I don't, when I, your registration allows me to email you so I can always send you an updated registration. You may need to keep your eyes open for that because we may end up getting a new, um, what you call it, link, uh, new um, registration link. What I will do if we do that, I will transfer you over to the new one. If you've been active in the class, like, you know, you've come any time over the course of this, uh, however many weeks we've been here. So you would get a new registration link and you would just keep it like before. But if I, as much as I can tell you, I'll tell you next week. But I, I had um, not seen his uh, his date yet. He often has waited till February to start back up, and that's what we did this past year. I'm thinking honestly, he probably gonna start in January. And the reason I believe that is because we are in a pandemic; everybody's locked down, <laughs> you know. Uh, but that's my guess. So my my. My speculation is we'll probably start around that third week of January, but I'll get that information and get it to you as soon as I can. Um, those who are on the website under the uh, Women Connected with Christ group, 
I'll post things in there from time to time, you know, that we can chat and share and what have you. Sometimes I do videos and give lessons that kind of way too. But in the meanwhile, we'll have a break for the winter, uh, Christmas and, uh, you know, Thanksgiving and such. And of course, we have New Year's Revival, with Bishop Jakes and company. So that's always a blessing. Um, keep your eyes on the website for all the details for that. Okay, now, um, let me, I'm not too bad, 8.34, so let me wrap this thing up. Bring my plane in for a landing. So um, I want to make sure before we go um, that you have a relationship with Christ. Hopefully you've learned through this couple of weeks of teaching on the hurt in Christ or church hurt. You've also learned that you have a place in the body of Christ. You're important to God. You're not an accident. Um, at, at some point, I'm thinking I'm going to do a teaching on the gifts, just an overview of the spiritual gifts and, and the different parts of the body of Christ. But I want you to think about this. We need you to be in place. We need you to be who God called you to be. It's not enough even to just say, oh, I love God. Are you being in place? I don't mean you got to go out and be John the Baptist, but I do believe God has a plan and a purpose for every life. And you should be pursuing and learning and growing. Our church has so many classes. Wherever you are in the world, you can take them on just about any topic you can think of. And they will teach you about your gifts, teach you about walking in different purposes, how to study the Bible. You name it, there's a class, discipleship classes everything you need i encourage you i implore you to get connected and learn who you are so you can eat your food and be content in christ but if you don't know him you've never accepted him for yourself you can't possibly be walking in your purpose you might have that thing like people have goosebumps you know they come to church and they feel good i remember i would talk to my girlfriend she would start crying and i was like well what are you crying i don't know because the Holy Ghost in me would just convict her. I wouldn't even try it. I would be just talking. And she'd just start crying every time. Because when God is drawing you, you, you feel his presence. But it's not the same as him being on the inside. You need to know him for yourself. You need a relationship with God. You can't just hang around the church and think you're the church. you got to be in Christ. How do you do that? It's very simple. You give him your heart. You say yes to the Lord. If you're... Not in a position where you know for certain that if you die right now, you have eternal life and you will spend your eternity with God. Today is the day of salvation. God planted me here to tell you, get right with God. I'm inviting you to type your name in that chat to say, yes, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I want to know who I am in God. I want to walk in my purpose. If you've gotten out of step, and some of us have, you know, it's, 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 it happens. Sometimes you have to refresh. You have to come back and rededicate and start afresh with God. And you want to rededicate. Just type your name in there and say, I want to rededicate my life to Christ. If you're not sure, you just don't know. I don't know if I'll go to heaven. I think I might. I don't know. Put your name. Just say, I'm not sure. If you want to join First Baptist Church of Glenarden, it is a wonderful church. I'm telling you, God has used Pastor Jenkins to bless my life so much. And then the body of Christ here. People are walking in their purpose. That's why the church functions so well. People have learned who they are and they walk in their purpose. That's why, not to put any other church down, but a whole lot of churches don't operate at the level we do because people don't know who they are and they're busy trying to be everybody else and everything else instead of walking in their lane. Get connected to this church. You will grow in who you're supposed to be if you take full advantage of the opportunities that God has put here. So if you want to give your life to Christ, put that in there. You want to rededicate, if you want to be sure, if you want to join a church, put your name in there and say, this is what I'm asking for. I encourage you as well to shoot me an email because I like to make sure I don't miss anybody. RevLettyCar at gmail.com. I love to be able to connect with you and make sure you're in a good place. We want to walk, make sure you're okay. Anytime you have any questions, you can always shoot me an email. I actually put a video on the website, whosoeverbelieves.org, where you can walk through the plan of salvation. Make sure you understand. And I invite you 
<coughs> excuse me, to put your prayer request there. There's a prayer wall there. We'll welcome your prayer request. Literally, people from all over the world pray over those prayer requests. I'm amazed. Uh, when we look at the statistics and see people come on there from, I mean, all over the world, and the first place they go often is straight to that prayer wall. That lets us know they're praying. And you look on there, you'll see people from Finland, Jap Japan, French, France, you know, putting their prayer requests. And just like they pray for the, us, we pray for them. So we um, thank God for each of you. I hope that you will not walk away and not take advantage of what God has put before you today. I don't believe in accidents. I believe if he allowed you to be here, it was for such a time as this. And he wants you to know your place in him. So don't leave without getting straight with God. <clears throat> Amen. I'm 10 minutes over. I apologize. I try to stay straight on it. But this has been a topic that has, praise God, raised up a lot of questions. I've gotten comments and texts and emails and people been telling me testimonies about, you know, it's been real. Um, but, but God, he will get us through this. And we will be the stronger for it. Imagine when the body of Christ gets on one accord, black, white, Chinese, French, whatever, we all on one accord. The devil is in trouble. And that's why he keeps us at each other. Because he knows as soon as we stop fighting each other, we're going to start fighting him. And his kingdom is coming down. So I encourage you, find your place and walk in it.